book of Hebrews, written to the Hebrew people who are Christians, who are in danger of backsliding or apostatizing and going back into Judaism. It was written to these people to show them that if they leave Christ, they have nothing. To do this, to do this, the writer of the book shows the superiority of Christ over everything that the Jew would hold dear or close to his heart. Thank you. He said that Christ is superior over the angelic order in chapters 1 and 2. He shows that Christ is superior over the mosaical order in chapter 3 to 4, 13. He shows that Christ is superior over the Levitical order in 4, 14 through 8, 13. He shows Christ's superior atonement in chapter 9 down through 10, 18. We have talked about him being superior to the angels, superior to Moses and Aaron, and superior to the Levitical order. That's what we talked about the last time I spoke, which is in chapter 4, 14 through 8, 18. But he ends that, or sums it all up, as he says in chapter 7, verse 23 and following. He says, For they indeed have been made priests many in number, but because of death they were hindered from continuing. But he, Jesus Christ, but he, because he abideth forever, has his priesthood unchangeable. Wherefore also he is able to save to the uttermost them that draw near unto God through him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such a high priest became us, holy, undefiled, without guile, separated from sinners, made high above the heavens, who need not daily as those priests to offer sacrifice both for himself and for the sins of the people, which he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law made men high priests having infirmity. But the word of the oath after the law appointed a son perfected forever. Now the things which were say, the chief point is this, that we have such a high priest who is set down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. A minister of the sanctuary, of the true sanctuary which the Lord pitched and not man. Jesus is our high priest. He serves in a heavenly sanctuary in the face, right before the face of God for us as high priest. But a high priest has to have some place to offer his sacrifices. Therefore, we see in chapter 9, verse 1, to chapter 10, verse 18, which speaks of Christ's superior sacrifice. We want to look at this in two points. His superior tabernacle and his superior sacrifice. In chapter 9, 1 through 12, He'll show Jesus' superior tabernacle where he serves. He says, now even the law, now even the first covenant had its ordinances of divine service and its sanctuary, a sanctuary of this world. And having made a, and, and having a tabernacle prepared, the first wherein is the candlestick, the table, the showbread, which is called the holy place. But after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the Holy of Holies, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of Covenant over, shadow, over covered with the gold round about. And in it, the golden pot for the manna, for Aaron's B uh, rod that budded and for the tablets of the covenants 
and above the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat, which things, he says, we cannot now speak severally. So he lays out in 1 through 5 the layout of this sanctuary, which is in a man-made tabernacle. And then in 6 and 7, he'll speak of the service, the work that goes on in that tabernacle. He said, these things thus being prepared, the priests go in continually into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service. But unto the second, the high priest alone, once a year, not without blood, that he offers for himself and for the heirs of the people. The service in that physical tabernacle. The priests go in continually. They offer continually, daily, every day they go in. The high priest, once a year, goes in with blood before the throne of God. How long has these things been taking place when the writer of the book of Hebrews writes? Well, Moses led the children out of Egypt about 1,446 years before Christ. So these sacrifices have been taking place for 1,500 years. And the priests go in continually and they offer these sacrifices all the time. They offer the sacrifice on the altar outside of the, tab outside of the holy place. Every morning and every night, for all the feast day, thousands and thousands of animals are slaughtered. Even for when people bring in their own. But once a year, the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies. He says, not without blood. If you read that in Leviticus 16, it speaks of the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Atonement. The priest takes a bull and two goats. And he offers the bull first and he takes that blood of the bull and he takes the incense, the, the incense from off the golden altar which is before the veil into the Holy of Holies. He takes that, that incense that the smoke would cover the, the uh, mercy seat that he not die. And then he goes out and offers a goat. He has two goats. One is the goat called Azel, which means to take away. The other one, he offers a sacrifice, takes its blood in, and puts on the mercy seat. Covering between God who comes down above the cherubim, and he covers that mercy seat, which is called in verse 5 here, the top of the Ark of Covenant. For in that is the law which says men are sinners. And he covers it there. And then in verses, uh, where do we get to? Six? Verse 7 through, no, 7, 8. Verses 8 through 10, he shows the limitation of that system. The limitation of that system. He says there, the Holy Spirit thus signifying that the way into the holy place, the real holy place, has not yet been manifest while the first tabernacle yet standeth, which is a figure of the time present. It's only a figure. The time present was speaking of these people who are Christians. Now, do they want to go back to a tabernacle which for 1,500 years have been offered? He says, which is a figure of the time present according to which are offered both gifts and sacrifices which cannot, cannot, as touching the conscious, make the worshiper perfect, being only meats and drinks and various washings, carnal ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. He speaks to these Jews. 1,500 years this has been going on. And it cannot, Make the worshiper perfect. All that, from the time they come out of Egypt, all that and all that took place cannot make the, the worshiper perfect. It's only carnal ordinances. And in verse 11, 
The first word is but. We want to thank God for the buts in the Bible. But, drawing a great contrast between verses 1 through 10 and verses 11 and 12. But Christ, having come a high priest of the good things to come, through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, nor yet by the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, entered in once for all unto the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. Great contrast. Those priests went in daily into a tabernacle made by hands. Jesus goes into the heavenly tabernacle, which man's hand didn't make. It's not even of this creation. And there he serves. The great, great tabernacle, the superior tabernacle not made with hands, the superior holy place, which is in heaven itself. And he, in this tabernacle, has something to offer. Verses 11 through 10, 9, 11 through 10, 18, speaks of his superior sacrifice. We need to go back to verse 11. We overlap 11 and 12 here to show his superior tabernacle, but to also show his superior sacrifice. For he says in verse 11 again, for Christ become a high priest of the good things to come through the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, nor yet of the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood entered in once for all into the holy place, having obtained eternal salvation. 13 and 14 makes a comparison again. Verse 13 says, For if the blood of goats and calves and the ashes of heifers, sprinkling them that were defiled, sanctified to the cleansing of the flesh. Again, we have the flesh. Remember in verse 10, it, these were only washings of carnal ordinances. It's just for the flesh. All that that was done in that tabernacle was a fleshly thing. It was made to keep the Jew in his right standing within his own people, within his own economy. But it said that all those cannot take away sin. Thirteen, the, the blood of calves and bulls, the ashes of heifer, compared with what in verse 14? But the blood of Christ... Much more, how much more shall the blood of Christ, he says, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish unto God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. We're cleansed from all, who, what would the dead works be there? He's talking to Jews, getting ready to go back into apostasy, into Judaism. The dead works is what's been taking place for 1,500 years. Because all that could not remove a sin. Now that's, that's another topic that needs to be studied another time. Because their sins were removed. But not by the blood of bulls and goats. So he says here, go back to verse 12. The last thing he says in verse 12, in my translation, having obtained eternal redemption. Eternal redemption. He compares that with what took place in the, in the tabernacle in chapter 10. In verse 1 in chapter 10, it said, For the law being a shadow of the good things to come. Remember in, in verse 11, Jesus became a high priest of the good things to come. Therefore, the law was just a shadow of the good things to come. It wasn't the good things. It was just a shadow. We said in verse, verse 9 of chapter 9, it was a figure of the present time. It's not the real thing. He said, 
Not the very image, remember back in verse 1 of chapter 10, not the very image of the thing, which offering they offered year by year, offering continually, can never make the person perfect who comes into him. Else it would not cease to have been offered. These offerings were made year by year, every year, 1,500 years they've been going on. And they cannot make perfect him that draws near. Of course, they would not have ceased to be offered. What was their problem? Verse 4 tells us, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. They sacrificed thousands and thousands. Read your Old Testament. When Solomon dedicated the temple, he offered thousands of sheep and thousands of bullocks. And it happened over and over again. All these animals slaughtered and they can't remove one sin. Can't remove one. That being a shadow, a figure, chapter 9, 9. If you go back to chapter 8, verse 5. It said, who served a copy and a shadow of the heavenly thing. Wherefore, when Moses, Moses was warned when he was about to build a tabernacle, God said, take heed that you make it according to the pattern, pattern which you received on the mountain. Why would they need to take heed? Because there is a real thing. All that old covenant was a shadow. It's a copy. It's a figure of the real thing. If you have a tree standing up here and the sun shining on it, it'll have a shadow over there. But the shadow's not the real thing. The tree's the real thing. When the sun goes down, there's no shadow anymore. The tree's still there. It's the real thing. God warned Moses, be sure you make that tabernacle according to the pattern. God wants his will done. Michael prayed this morning. Prayed that what we do would be pleasing to God. What's taking place right now, brethren, is a serious thing. Those priests entered in to the holy place and the high priest into the holy of holies, which is just a shadow. It's not even the real thing. And he says, you take heed that you do all things according to the pattern. If you needed to take heed to the pattern of a shadow, we certainly need to take heed to the pattern he gives us. Many people claiming to believe in God and Jesus are not diligent in holding to the pattern. And they say, the grace of God will cover what we're doing. Did it cover them when they were just worshiping in a shadow? Leviticus 10, what happened to Nadab and Abihu? Nadab and Abihu, who are they? Sons of Aaron, the high priest. They were the right people. They took their censers, the right thing that they're supposed to do, and they put on incense, which they offered on the, on the golden altar before the veil, before the Holy of Holies. They were the right people doing the right thing. But what did they do? Said they used strange fire. Did God ever tell them not to use that fire? Nope. But he told him what fire to use. And that's the point. They were to use the fire from off the altar of sacrifice and put it in there and then take it in and offer it to God. They used what the Bible says in Leviticus 10 in my translation, strange fire. That means it was fire that God didn't command. And was God pleased with that? He sent fire and consumed both of them right there. Killed them. Burned them up. 
right there. They were just serving in a shadow, not the real thing. But we would think that's such a little thing. God didn't forbid them to use that fire. But he told them what fire to use. And when God killed them, if you read in Leviticus 10, God commanded Aaron, who is their father, and Eliezer and Ithamar, who is their brothers, don't let your hair come down, don't tear your clothes. In other words, don't you even show any sorrow for my killing them, lest you die. God is serious about the worship that he accepts. Don't do what God has not commanded. It's an abomination to God. If that's so, if that's so strict in that which is just a shadow, how much more will it be for us who are worshiping before the face of God? What we're doing right now is serious. We come here together and we love each other and we visit and laugh and have a great time. But my brethren, when we start this corporate worship which we offer to God, it's a solemn thing. Because we're not in a tabernacle made by hands. We're sitting in a church building made by hands, but our worship is right before the throne of God. Where Jesus is at the right hand of God. We need to think when we come in here and sit down and we worship God. Think where you are. You're right before God. That takes care of all the visiting and and, and what takes place. We need to consider where we are. We took the Lord's Supper a while ago. Right in front of whom? Jesus who died on that cross for us. We have fellowship with Him. It's a serious thing what we do in our worship. We're praising God and it's all taking place right before the throne of God. When we pray, we're standing right in the presence of God and talking to God. When we sing praises to Him, we're standing right before God. And singing to him. It's a serious thing. They just had a shadow. They just had a figure. They didn't even have the real thing. But we do. But we do. And when he says in verse 4, chapter 10, it's impossible that the blood of bulls and goats can take away sin. Verse 5 says, Wherefore, when he came into the world, the he there is Jesus. Therefore, when he came into the world, he saith. Now, when he says he saith, he quotes what is said in Psalms 40, verse 6 through 8. And then he reiterates that in verses 9, uh, excuse me, 8 and 9. Verses 8 and 9, he says, saying above. Saying above, that's what's written right above what he said. That which is said in Psalms 40. Saying above, sacrifice and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou wouldest not and you have no pleasure in them. Which things are offered according to the law. Has no pleasure in them. Therefore, what happens? When he comes into the world. That's taken up in verse 9. Chapter 10, verse 9. Then hath he said, Lo, I come, that's Jesus, to do thy will. He taketh away the first so that he can establish the second. He took away all this shadow, all this copy, all this this, uh, figure. And he established the real. He established the second one. The first one is the first covenant, the Mosaical covenant, that he might establish the second covenant. That's the covenant between us and Christ. And then he says, in verse 10, in verse 10, after he says, he took away the first that he could establish the second, by which will? 
By which will, that's the testament, that's the covenant, by which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Jesus does it all for us for all times. We worship right in the throne room of God. He'll tell you over in verse 19. Having, brethren, therefore, boldness to enter into the holy place through the blood of Jesus, through the way which he, Jesus, dedicated to us a new and a living way through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. We have the boldness to go right into the heavenly throne room and talk to God. And that's where we are now when we worship God. And then he makes a contrast again. In verse 11, contrast with verse 12. He says in verse 11, For every priest standeth. Standeth. That means he is standing. That's present tense. It's continually going on. For every priest standeth day by day, ministering and often and offering often the same sacrifice which can never, which can never take away sin. That's taking place in the tabernacle. But he, when he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God. The difference is they were standing because they could never accomplish that which they were doing. Jesus, when he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, he sat down at the right hand of God. Whenceforth, if you read on, whenceforth expecting till his enemies be made the footstool of his feet. For by one offering, verse 14, for by one offering he has perfected them that are sanctified. We have a superior tabernacle. Our tabernacle is in heaven itself. And we have the privilege 24 hours a day, seven days a week to go right to the throne of God and talk to God. He said in the verse which we read a while ago, verse 19, we go there with boldness. I said last week, the word boldness means boldness to speak. We can stand right before God and because of the blood of Jesus and His cleansing of us, we stand before God reckoned as righteous. And we have the privilege of speaking boldly before God the things that are on our heart. We have a great, superior tabernacle. It's a perfect one. It's in heaven. And it is there eternally. We have the perfect and superior sacrifice. The blood of our Lord Jesus. One time for all. But he said, in verse 27 of chapter 9. Inasmuch as it is appointed unto men once to live, and after that cometh judgment. We pass this way one time. And our whole purpose in being here is to give glory to God, serve Him, and obey Him. We have no other reason for being on this earth. Everybody that's not doing that has sold out to Satan. They have no hope. They'll spend an eternity with Satan in the fires of hell. We come to judgment. We all die. We live one time. There's no reincarnation. We die one time and we come to judgment. The next verse says, So Christ also, having been offered to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time apart from sin to them that wait for him unto eternal salvation. You see in chapter 9, verse 12, he obtained eternal redemption which he cleanses us in the blood of Jesus, 
eternal redemption. And he will come again to receive us unto eternal salvation, to be with him forever and ever. If you're not in Christ, you forfeit, or you never had, all of these great blessings which Christ gives to us. His superior atonement, his superior tabernacle, his superior sacrifice, he gives to us free. Judd said this morning, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of Christ is eternal life forever. If you're not in Christ, you have no hope. If you've, like these Jews were in danger of, wandered away from Christ, you need to come back to Christ. Because there's nothing anywhere in this world outside of Christ that's even worth mentioning. So if you have any need, come while we stand and sing.